Hey gang, uh, thank you for joining me today. I'm standing here outside on the patio of the Angus Barn, one of the finest, I suppose, maybe the most traditional um, restaurant in Raleigh, North Carolina, longest established, that kind of thing. You know, it is the place, the Angus Barn. They serve really, really, really good <laughs> Anguses. <laughs> Everybody loves this place, of course, except for the Anguses. <laughs> they don't care much for it. <laughs> um, and I'm painting for Caroline and Casey, who are getting married today, right on the premises. And uh, I'll wait till that noise goes away. As you know, every every wedding painting is a little different adventure. Today is no exception. Um, Caroline and Casey picked one of the uh, paintings on my website, my wedding painting website, that they liked particularly well. Now, the one they picked is actually a, was not a live painting. It was uh, one done from, from photographs. And it's a very nice one but it took a little bit longer than the average. Anyway, I, I, uh, I'm not complaining. I'm taking it as a challenge. So that this painting today, this wedding painting, is going to be a little bit more of a portrait. Is that enough energy, do you think? Uh, one of the other challenges, and again, I take it as a good challenge, is the interior. You can see, actually see several uh, on my wedding on my website, WeddingPainterMagic.com, you can see several other paintings that I have done here at the Angus Barn. And the interior of the room is extremely warm. Everything is brown, orange, uh, brown, orange, yellow, red, you know, wood color, natural. It's a beautiful room, but uh, this particular client has asked for not a predominantly brown painting, which I feel like is their prerogative. <laughs> it's my prerogative to, to say, heck no, I'm not gonna do that job. <laughs> which of course I'm loath to do. So uh, it's my job then to take their request and uh, turn it into a beautiful painting. And again, I, I honestly, Welcome to the challenge. Uh, something a little bit different. So my underpainting, as you can see, tends slightly toward the cool end of the spectrum, even though, oh, no, 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 let me say, normally I would do counter, but on this painting I'm doing consonant, not contrasting, but consistent with the tonality of the finished painting. In other words, I want this painting to have a lot of cool in it, so I'm doing a cool underpainting. Normally, I go the other way around. But. And I'm just going to pause right there because I need this to dry before I can proceed. So, little break. I'll be back in just a few minutes. Thanks for watching. All right, welcome back. I am uh, working off a photograph. You can barely see over here to the right of my easel. I have uh, my backup phone that serves as my camera. Anyway, I'll show you when, when I go inside later and uh, show you the um, the context, the setting. I'll show it to you then. I can't do it right now, so we'll just 
carry on. For some reason, I'm in a mood tonight to, I think it's because of all the instruction they've given me about the, the overall palette of the painting, that they don't want it overly brown. I'm a little bit extra self-conscious. Orange and brown, see the orange I just put on there? <laughs> so I'm a, little, I'm a little extra conscious of, of the overall color. Hello. <laughs> So um, I'm just in the mood to, to get some of this down quickly, get, get broad areas of color. Okay, now, now I can start doing a little bit of drawing. Again, a number of, a number of little things that are different about tonight's painting. One is, that uh, this is going to be more of a full-size, full-on portrait than is, than is normal for my wedding paintings. You know, usually, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to the difference, to the challenge. Um, As you, if you follow me at all, you know that most of the time, the portraits I end up doing of the bride and groom are no bigger than the last section of my thumb, which is a horribly small, horribly small portrait. Uh, so tonight, they are going to be larger, which on one hand, will make it an easier prospect. Um, but on the other hand, <laughs> it means sort of like no, no excuses, no anything. Um, tonight I am doing a portrait, <laughs> a full on, full on portrait. Of a, of a double portrait of a bride and groom uh, live in front of everybody so just just a little bit different normally you know it's a whole painting with a small portrait in it this is going to be significantly different than that this is going to be I'm just about talking myself into being intimidated can you can you tell that <laughs> that's where this is going it's like golly what am I doing this is nuts <laughs> and yet, uh, honest here are going to be, uh, you know, the size of two knuckles <laughs> instead of one. So, technically, it should be easier. We'll find out. I do know, I will tell you how I'm almost certainly going to, to the process I'm going to take, though. Um, I am going to start out painting... Uh, as I'm doing right now, drawing uh, just by pure quick observation, if you will, without any double checking, uh, without any cheating of any kind whatsoever. And uh, I will, and, and I do, I find this pretty important. Um, I will be drawing in the bride and groom Again, without any, uh, without any gridding or measuring or anything like that, just plain old-fashioned gut it out. 
look at it and draw. Uh, and then probably, probably after that, after having a decent go at uh, drawing them, then if necessary, and I'm assuming it probably, probably will be necessary, uh, if necessary, I will uh, launch into some mechanical tricks, which in this case will almost certainly be um, I'm talking so slowly, aren't I? Will almost certainly be gridding, using a grid. Now, one of the things I have discovered, and, and I, this is just part of my weakness as a as a portrait painter, it just shows up my weakness. Um, I find it doing doing two people, two figures, and these will be full length figures. Doing two figures is significantly more difficult than doing one. Um, now that sounds like an excuse, and and it is, <laughs> but it's also a What's the word? I'm like, it's also a true excuse, or it's a, yeah, I think, I think that's reasonable, um, that getting one person drawn in um, is hard enough, if you will, and capturing a perfect likeness. It's the perfect part that I have a hard time with. I can capture a likeness, you can tell who it is, but that's not good enough for the, you know, the people that are paying me to do this, just being able to tell who it is is not, is not good enough. It needs to be, quote unquote, a perfect likeness. So for that, I usually, usually fall back into, uh, usually doing a grid. And if you want, I'll, if you're still with me, I will show you later on exactly how I do that grid. My tricks, my particular tricks. I'm assuming that every, every person who's ever done, taken junior high art or high school art has learned how to do a grid. And that's basically what I'm going to do. Although I've got a few tricks up my sleeve to um, make the grid better, probably better than the one you learned in high school, probably, okay? A little bit more, a little bit more thorough, a little bit more helpful. Uh, and the answer is not, by the way, the answer is not just more uh, finer and finer and finer squares. Um, the reason is, is, and again, anybody who's tried to do the grid method, after a while, <laughs> it's not a very long while, with, with the finer your grid is, the greater chance there is for you getting lost. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> Been there, done that. So, uh, no, I have a, a, a ver some variations on that. Okay, now a lot of this stuff that I'm doing right now, of course, is going to have a, a bride and groom <laughs> right in front of it. So all these details that I'm drawing, I'm trying to get the perspective correct. Okay, flowers, 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 chairs, heads, um, attendants. So this is, these will be some of the bride, the groomsmen, I presume, and bridesmaids over here. Now please don't tell anybody I said this, and if you, if you say I said it, I will deny everything. <laughs> Because what I'm about to say could might not be perfectly politically correct, but here it is. You know it anyway. Uh, the bride is very pretty, and that makes my job just a little bit easier. And even more importantly, the groom is taller than the bride, <laughs> and that makes my job a little bit easier because I don't have to try to 
make him look tall. <laughs> so shh. <laughs> Those are the inner secrets that probably should have remained a secret, but the truth's out now. Um, now, by the way, let me let me correct something though. If you're if you are uh, perhaps a, a novice portrait painter, be warned. Um, it is not easier to do portraits of beautiful people um, because beautiful people are beautiful mostly, not entirely, but mostly because they are average. <laughs> every course, every high school kid in the world goes, that's not true, but just Google it. Google, beautiful people are average, and you'll find pages and pages that will amaze you. So um, beautiful people have not many features that set them apart. So capturing, capturing a perfect likeness of a typically beautiful person is actually more difficult because there's less to distinguish one beautiful woman from another beautiful woman. They tend to have similar features. Does that make sense? It's really true. I know it sounds weird. But anyway, just in case, in case you're a student, draw ugly people. <laughs> Okay, I am only halfway serious. You'll be glad to know. So this, this by the way, is a fireplace. Oh, well, let me do one more thing before I go. Fireplace, flowers, flowers, and people. Um, and again, I've got the, uh, the photograph, which you can't see, is way over here on my phone right there. I know you can't see that, but that's what I'm working from right now. Let me do a little bit more green. Green, green, green. I don't usually do this. I don't usually do green as an underpainting for green, if you know what I mean. I don't usually use green for an underpainting of green stuff, but I'm making an exception here tonight. Now, I'll do other colors on top of that green, of course. Be, you know, before I come back to green, I'm talking too much. Okay, so <laughs> time for me to take a little break. I want this to dry. Ooh, I like those runs, by the way. Can you see that? What just happened when some drips came down in front of some, some not quite dry paint, and then when I wiped it off, the paint came off? That's a nice effect. I like it. <laughs> the first time that happened, I, I hair stood on it, and I went, ah! And then I thought about it for a minute, and I went, wait a minute, that looks kind of cool. Um... I'm trying to think. I'm trying really hard to think. <laughs> I believe I can go right straight to sketching in bride and groom. So no, I don't have to take a break. Let's keep right on going. Um, and by the way, part of the reason that I, I don't want to use any a grid early on is because I think if I if I start um, gridding, um, I won't I won't be able to see uh, the big picture. So I'm and again even the even the long handled brushes help me stand back a little bit. <laughs> we stand back even further, couldn't I? Stand back from the canvas and see the big picture. Because it's extremely important the placement of the placement of the bride and groom in this space, of course, is probably the most important uh, decision aspect of the painting is, is rough drawing. I'm under no circumstances am I obligated, once I've got this sketched in, under no circumstances am I 
obligated to stick with this drawing. Does that make sense? I do not, and, and I will certainly, will not. I do not trust this drawing. I don't trust it to be accurate. Um, in fact, I'm gonna do something unusual. I'm actually gonna wipe off what I just did. I don't, I don't do that very often. I tell my students, don't erase. Um, making an exception here. So I already know that I, I wanna move my bride and groom to the right a little bit there, too much in the center of the painting. So too bad, all that pretty stuff that I had under there, it's now all smeared. But don't worry about it too much. Okay, let's do that again. So here we go again. I'm gonna use a different color this time, partly just so I can distinguish between what I just did and what I'm about to do. Um, the bride and groom are both tall and thin. It just, just, just makes my job a little bit easier because I don't have to exaggerate or stretch them too much. You know, they already have a regal bearing. Look at you guys. Yeah. I have this, I don't know, this thing, uh, this uh, hierarchy of um, benefits. <laughs> I, I bring up sometimes with people that I'm trying to influence toward wisdom. It's kind, it's kind of tongue in cheek, but one of them is reflected in what I just said right there. Here, here it is. It's, it starts with every, every one of these hierarchy elements starts with Life is easier if, and here it is, generally speaking, life is easier if you're tall. And some of you tall people don't know that. You just think, what, what, that's not true. And all us medium height people go, uh-huh, it is. You get, you get benefits, you get bennies. When you walk into a room, if you're taller than average, and I'm a teenager, I read that the average height of an American male was five, nine and three quarters, and that's exactly what I was. So, like, so, but now that I've given you that one, life is tall. Life is easier if you're tall. Let me give you a few more. This is again true, but kind of tongue in cheek. Okay, I, can, I think I can keep painting, especially since my inane banter <laughs> is so uh, fascinating. <laughs> uh, I'll look at your comments later. You can say <laughs> it is inane and it's not fascinating. Okay, so here's here's some other. Hierarchy of benefits is not the word I'm looking I need to come up with a better word. Okay, life is easier. Life is easier if you're tall. Here's an easy one. Life is easier if you're beautiful. Duh. Duh. The beautifuler you are, the more life is easy. Now, I don't mean nobody's life is easy. That, by the way, goes without saying nobody's life is easy. I'm just saying on a you know, binary, if you're ugly or you're handsome or you're beautiful or you're homely, life is easier, generally speaking, doesn't mean you're gonna have an easy life. Nobody has an easy life. But it just means your life's easier if you're good looking. Um, here's another one. Life is easier if you are a morning person. And again, most of the time we don't know, we don't recognize it. If we are, if we ex are, are, have some of these things, we're oblivious to our advantages. Oh, here's in America, life is easier if you're white. <laughs> oh boy, I'm getting political there, but anyway. I don't, I don't know how, I don't, now, now, I, I don't go in with all the white guilt, trash, or reverse racist crap that's going on in our culture today. I, I don't agree with that, don't go with that at all. But life is easier if you're white. But uh, let's get away from political stuff. Life is easier if you're a morning person. Did I say that already? Life is easier if you're a morning person. Ah, life is easier if you're an extrovert. And again, I, I don't mean your life is going to be easy. No, 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 nobody's life is easy, but your life is easier 
tends to be, of course, I should be saying tend to, I'm speaking generalities here, I, hoping, hoping that goes without saying. Uh, life is easier. If you're a morning person, life is easier. If you're an extrovert, um, of course, then it gets down to, well, life is easier with any benefit you have whatsoever. If you're mechanically minded, life is easier. If you are, uh, this goes with being an extrovert, if you are uh, a smooth talker, life is easier. Okay, that's kind of extrovert thing. Um, of course, life is easier if you're smart, but that's, <laughs> that's no, I, I don't know, for some reason, that's like, that's getting too, that's getting too something. <laughs> So I think it behooves most of us to go, wow, you know what? I don't have all of those, but I have several. I have some. And uh, <laughs> here's, maybe, here's one you can do something about. Life is easier if you're grateful. Life is easier if you are grateful. There's a whole bunch of things that trump, that, that trump the, 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 the things I'm saying. Okay? Anyway, I got out of that. It's, forgive me, I had to say something while I was filling that in because these people are both good looking and tall. And doggone it, they're probably extroverts and morning people. Those kind of people just make me sick. <laughs> okay, so there you go. You can kind of see uh, how those figures are. Yeah, I think I like, I think that's good. Here's the center, here's the center between them. Uh, here's the horizon, here's them. So I feel like the positioning, we get to, we still get to see, in fact, I can do some of it now. We still get to see uh, through the fireplace, by the way, through the fire, it's a fireplace that opens on both sides. Does that make sense? And, and uh, if anybody's been to Angus Barn Pavilions, this, this part of their establishment, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Great big fireplace, big enough that you can walk into it, but you walk right through it because um, it's, it's open on both sides. And on the far side of the fireplace is um, open windows. And I, I plan to make much, I expect to make much of that light uh, coming through. And, and it'll be a cool evening twilight light. That will help a lot in keeping, as my client requested, in keeping this from becoming a... Uh, brown warm orange painting and again as i said earlier i feel that is in my opinion com perfectly within their prerogative as the clients to, to make such requests and then of course it's within my prerogative to say heck no i'm not going to do that painting you know not i'm not going to get paid that's it's not an option i take ever that I, I don't think i've ever hardly ever turned down a Um, a commission because they, they made some rather minor requests like that. Let me go back to my photograph of the just the space itself. Oh yeah, candles up here. One, whoops, one, two, three, four, and lanterns. Old-fashioned kind of brass lanterns up there. While I'm at it, let's go ahead and do flowers, the impression of floral arrangement stuff. It's going to be a loud, loud night again tonight. Uh, I have my earplugs. I will enjoy the band and try to not suffer any additional hearing loss. <laughs> I'll be wearing my earplugs pretty much the entire night. And then when that happens, I will turn the sound off, both for copyright reasons, well, mostly for copyright reasons, because you can't, you can't broadcast music on YouTube, okay? Hey, I'm fairly, fairly happy with how that's looking so far. I'm going to take a little break now because I do need this white paint to dry before I come back. When I come back, I'll probably uh, 
do a little bit of quick sketching in pencil. Okay, thanks for watching. I will continue. All right, so the reception, I mean, the ceremony is over. And uh, I took time during the ceremony to put all natural. I'm still working uh, without a grid. Again, see how much of this I can. Again, partly because everybody, anybody who's ever tried to use a grid, you know, it has definite drawbacks. First of all, it takes a long time. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to start out drawing. And I may decide to do a grid later on. Now, there's no question, by the way, right now, again, it's very unconventional to use pencils in an oil painting. I admit that immediately uh, but I like the look I like the look the feel that it gives to a finished painting and plus of course at this point there's no question that I'm using the linear quality of the pencil to achieve quick similitude quick drawing decisions so we will just see see how that goes I did a quick preliminary measurement a little while ago just using my fingers on my rough sketch here and if my if my quick measurement was correct, um, I've got both of these figures at about nine heads tall. <laughs> and they, they are both tall people, so they're probably actually, uh, each of them, about eight heads tall. Um, but I have, of course, over whatever I've exaggerated so I'll try not to exaggerate too much that's that's the hard part how much can you get away with and that is a good question part of the answer is of course you can get away with more in the legs than you can in the upper body like I'm not going to elongate their heads of course I'm not going to elongate their too much their upper chest torso a little bit but I can get away with quite a bit of elongation in the legs and so that in fact is what I will try to do uh, okay gonna make a quick adjustment already that is that I'm gonna erase the head that I just drew on him again keeping my keeping staying light on my feet not letting myself get locked in prematurely. And that's not coming off very well, so I'll leave it at that. Let me redraw him, this head, a little bit bigger than what I did last time. And evidently a little bit messier. <laughs> I'm 
going to mix up a little bit of neutral flesh colored paint here. Combined with my pencils, so now, now my eye is drawn to the light areas of uh, Casey's face because I'm using a light medium. So I tend to see his face slightly differently than I did just a few minutes ago. So that helps. Beginning to get accustomed to the dimensions and his upper lip. What's the distance between his eyebrows and the top of his eye? So on and so on and so forth. I go back and forth quite a bit between using a grid and not. Um, and there have been times that I've used a grid and regretted it. <laughs> and there have been times that I have not used a grid and regretted that. So there's no easy... Okay, tell you what, I'm just going to... That sort of gives me a blank. Okay, clearly, there we go. That's the, that's the inside I'm looking for. All of a sudden I look up and said, wait a minute. That head's too short. That's good, that's the kind of thing I'm looking for. Again, I think a big advantage is don't let yourself get locked in prematurely. Now let me look. <laughs> now his head's too big, if you can believe it. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's funny. So now I'm going to shrink his head. First I made it too big, too small, then I made it too big. Okay, that might be right. Let's try that a little bit. Before I leave though, let, I can do a little bit of shirt collar. Sort of a visual anchor point. This tie is crooked in the photograph. I promised him that I would straighten it out in the painting. I have to remember, maybe that would be easy to forget <laughs> and paint it the way it is. <laughs> Let me try to focus on the major light planes on his head for a moment. Okay, I kind of like that messy approach right there. Well, let's go back to some drawing. That's a longitudinal line indicating the center of his face. Those are his eyes. Uh, nose turns down slightly, not that much. And mouth. Bring the bridge of his nose forward more than the painting. I 
I think probably the number one thing I would preach to students at this point is be patient. I'm saying this to myself as well. Don't get, don't get in too big of a hurry. Be patient, let it. Don't, don't trust any of your marks at this point, okay? So I'm back to making his head bigger again. <laughs> now, if my early measurement was correct, that I really do have them about nine heads tall, and I, I really do have some room to play, I can, uh, I can afford to make his head bigger. Uh, I'm going to move his collar down a little bit, make his neck a little bit longer, make his shoulder a little bit wider. There we go. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Uh, yeah, shoulder a little bit wider over here too. Okay, so can you see I drew it here once and now I've changed my mind significantly. I'm gonna go ahead, even though I don't trust necessarily that I've got his mouth in the right place, I'm gonna go ahead and put a white line there because it's gonna be just about impossible to see if I have any kind of likeness at all if I don't uh, do some features. Hello. Very good. I'll be here all night. <laughs> yep, yep. I do have a little bit of a likeness, a little bit. His mouth's open way too wide, so let's fix that real quick. I'm mixing uh, paint here, acrylics, um, on the handle of one of my wooden brushes, <laughs> one of my cheap brushes, cheap chip brushes. I'm, I'm uh, Uh, okay, something's wrong. It's looking like a human being. It's not, look, not looking enough like him. Again, I feel like the, one of the chief goals is don't panic. Just keep working. I'm, I'm going to take a break here in a little while, partly because already just with this little bit of work that you've seen me do, um, portrait blindness is already beginning to set in. <laughs> I feel like that's a very important principle that uh, every portrait painter should be very aware of this. After 15 or 20 minutes of, of looking at a face, you're, uh, really more of looking at your rendering of the face, you become essentially blind to your mistakes. And then, in my opinion, you have to do one of several different things to give yourself fresh eyes. And the, the, most, the most simple in, a, in the traditional world is simply to step back, and I haven't done that yet, so I will do that, to step back from my painting and uh, look at him from a longer distance. Step number two in the traditional world is sleep on it. Go to bed and come back tomorrow, you'll have fresh eyes. Number three, this again, still talking like in the old fashioned world without any high tech to help. Number three is, um, um, <laughs> thank you. Long ways to go, but <laughs> getting, getting there, getting there. And, and step number three, what did I say? Number one, step back. Number two, sleep on it, which of course I don't have that option here. And, uh, number, yeah, it is, but I'll switch to oil pretty soon, or after a while. It'll be an oil painting. That's, that's right. 
<laughs> um, and thank you. The other, what was I saying? Number one, step away. Number two, sleep on it. Number three, uh, um, look at it in a mirror. Okay, so all of those, all, all the ancient artists all had access to those three tricks that I just mentioned. Now there are several that us modern people have. One is if you're working from a photograph, which they didn't have, if you're working from a photograph, turn it, the photograph, and your painting upside down and work upside down. That's, and that's you know, straight out of uh, Betty Edwards' left side of the brain type, type stuff. Good trick. Um, and let me give you a, oh, here's another one that the old timers had, just like we do. And I, this is made probably my favorite. I just don't have, a much, I can't do it much here uh, tonight. And that is work on more than one portrait at a time. Uh, in fact, I discovered working on somewhere between five and because, so I just spend 10, 12, 15 minutes at the most on one face. I've already done way more than that on uh, Casey's face. And, uh, but if I were to work on him for just a few minutes, or we'll work on somebody else, and then come back to him, I see it with fresh eyes. Does that make sense? So I can do that a little bit here because I'm gonna be working on two of them. But two's not enough. Um, I'll be blind to, in with just a little bit of time, I'll be blind to both of them. But uh, again, that's a trick that would have been available to the old masters. Okay, here's the tricks that are not available to them. Uh, take a picture with your phone. And just taking the picture and then seeing it, take a picture of your painting, that is. And just seeing a picture of your painting on your phone screen will immediately show you mistakes and errors. 